Hello, everyone, and welcome to our worship service today. It's nice to know that uh, even in a time of world pandemics and social distancing, that uh, with the help of a little technology, we can still study God's Word together. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in various parts of our world and our country and uh, take a few moments out to study your word together. We pray that as we do, help us to catch a glimpse of your love and your glory and your will for our life. Be with each one of us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It was a new day. The light of dawn was filling the room as she struggled for consciousness. Where was she? Who was the man still sleeping beside her? Slowly, the pieces of her life fell into place as dreams gave way to reality. Her life was a mess. She was a survivor and seemed to always manage to find a way through the pain in her life. But the last couple of weeks had been particularly difficult. Lately, she had found it hard to even get out of bed and face the day. Why did life have to be such a struggle? When she was a young girl, she was sure that she had it all figured out. She was certain that she knew exactly what would bring her happiness, peace, and satisfaction. Marry rich, have lots of kids, then lots of grandkids, and die happy. But as she grew into a beautiful young woman and tried hard to make her dreams become a reality, her confidence had been quickly shattered. Money, as it turned out, did not equal happiness and her first marriage had ended badly, painfully. Still, she was a determined woman, a resourceful woman, who, like a cat, always seemed to land on her feet. She had made it her quest in life to find joy and contentment. She married again. And when that didn't work out, she married again. And again, always chasing the dream, the elusive dream. When her fifth marriage also ended, she was beginning to despair. What was the point, she wondered. And yet, deep in her heart, she knew that there must be answers to her questions. Satisfaction to her longing. She would not rest until she found them. However, this morning, as she lay in bed and let her mind drift over the years, she realized that she had failed miserably. She had tried it all, and nothing seemed to work. Her marriages had left her empty, Relationships had let her down. Even the best wine had only masked her pain. Food had made her plump. She had even gone through a rigorous religious phase and spent years studying the teachings of Moses, trying hard to live a devout life. Nothing had been able to fill up the emptiness that she felt in her life. It was like she had a thirst that could not be quenched, a hunger that could not be satisfied, a void in her life that could not be filled. She pressed her hand into her chest. Why did it hurt so much? The body beside her began to stir and she decided that as hard as it was, she would get out of bed one more day. 
as she made a hasty breakfast, she noticed that the water was low. She would need to make a trip to the well, and the thought made her groan. She hated the way that the other women in town looked at her and the way they talked about her behind her back. The worst offenders seemed to congregate around the well, exchanging their mindless gossip. What right did they have to judge her? They had no idea what she had been through, how hard she had tried, how much it hurt. She would wait until later. Hopefully, they would all be gone. As the sun took its place in the middle of the sky, she set out for the well. In the heat of the day, not many people were on the narrow streets, and the murmurs and hisses were few as she made her way past the homes. As she approached the well, her heart sank some. She had hoped that she would be able to get her water quickly and slip away unnoticed. But someone was there, resting by the well. As she got closer, she sighed a quick breath of relief as she noticed that it was a man, a Jewish man at that. It was a little strange that he was sitting there. Jews didn't often pass through her village. If they did, they rarely stopped. At least she wouldn't have to worry about having to talk to him. Jews considered her people to be nothing but dogs and rarely had any interaction with them. She would be fine. But as she approached the well and began to lower her pail into the well, the man spoke. It startled her at first. She wasn't expecting it. My good woman, he said, I wonder if you could give me a drink. Gaining her composure a little, she, she looked at the man to make sure that he was really a Jew. Never had she seen a man quite like this. There was a sweet kindness in his face and a kind of honesty and sincerity in his countenance. She liked him immediately, but knew that she must be cautious. Sir, how is it that you are asking me for a drink? Jews hardly have anything to do with Samaritans, let alone a Samaritan woman. The man looked at her in silence. She was used to men looking at her, but this was definitely different. As their eyes made contact, it was as though he was looking right into her soul, reading the story of her life. After what seemed like an eternity, the man smiled gently at her and said, If only you knew the true gift of God and who it was that was asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink and he would have given you a drink of living water. The man speaks in riddles, she thought. She struggled to speak. Sir, you don't even have anything to draw the water, and the, the well is deep. From where would you get this living water to give me a drink? Once again, the man smiled at her. No one had smiled at her like that before. It was so warm, kind, and accepting. It was a good thing that he really couldn't read her mind, or he wouldn't be smiling at her like that. A Jew talking to a Samaritan woman, smiling at a Samaritan woman, especially a woman like her. People who drink of this well, he began, will get thirsty again. But 
people who drink of the water that I have to give will never thirst again. The water that I give people is like a spring that bubbles up inside them, even unto eternal life. There were those riddles again. What was he talking about? Springs of water inside your body, never thirsting again, eternal life. She decided to play along. It sure would be nice not to have to come out to this well again in the heat of the day. Please, sir, give me some of this living water so that I would never have to come back to this well again. But even as the words fell out of her mouth, she realized that this man was talking about something much deeper than everyday water. What was it he called it? Living water. Go get your husband and come back to the well, and I will give you this living water, he said. Her face flushed, and suddenly she found it hard to swallow. I don't have a husband, she stammered as she hung her head and looked away. What would he think of her? She wasn't dressed as a widow, and a woman without a husband could only mean one thing. Even this kind Jewish man who spoke to Samaritan women would surely turn away from a woman who had no husband. Slowly, she lifted up her head, fully expecting to see a look of disgust, contempt, and condemnation. To her amazement, he was still smiling, his eyes almost twinkling with amusement. You speak very honestly. The truth is that you have had five husbands, and the man that you are with right now is not your husband, so... Your answer is very true. I, I like that. She stood there stunned. How did he know that? Could it be that he had been here at the well earlier today and heard the other women talking about her? But how would he know that they were talking about her? Maybe this man truly had been reading the story of her life as he looked into her eyes. It was a little unnerving. She decided to change the subject, distract him, take the spotlight off her life. Now, how did you know that? she asked. You must be some kind of a prophet. I have a question for you. For many years, there's been a debate between our people and yours about where we should worship. Our ancestors worshipped God right here in this mountain. But you Jews say that the only place that God can be worshipped is in Jerusalem. What do you believe? The man motioned for her to step out of the sun, and together they sat down under the shade of a pomegranate tree. He smiled at her again as he began with his wonderful kind voice. The time is coming, my good woman, and in fact is already here when true believers of God will worship him wherever they are. You see, God is a spirit, and he is everywhere. He longs to live inside the hearts of people, and when that happens, they are able to truly worship him in spirit, wherever they are. And there, by Jacob's well, under the shade of a pomegranate tree, the kind Jewish man pulled back the veil of heaven and in a few short moments revealed the mysteries of the universe to a woman who had been searching her whole life for truth, meaning, and purpose. 
the teachings of Moses that you have so carefully studied have been misinterpreted, misapplied. The God of heaven is not looking for worshipers who blindly follow a list of rules, regulations, and traditions. He is looking for a people who will allow him to transform their lives with his character of absolute love. The message of all scripture, the books of Moses that you have studied, and all the prophets that followed can be summed up with two principles. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and love and respect your neighbor as much as you do yourself. Because of the sin of this world, people in their natural state are primarily selfish and thus not able to follow even these two simple principles. That's why you need to drink of the living water. That's why you need to let the Spirit of God fill your life. He wants to write His character of love into your very heart and mind, transforming you into a person who naturally does His will, treating others with kindness, genuine love, and respect. It was amazing. After spending her whole life searching for meaning and happiness, after years of study and devoutly following the teachings of her priests, her desperate attempt to fill the sadness and emptiness in her life suddenly resolved with a few words from a Jewish stranger. Could it be that simple? Could all of the philosophies and teachings of the world be so quickly washed away by something so easy, the Spirit of God and His love inside her, communion with Him, worshiping Him in spirit wherever she was, every moment of her life? It somehow seemed surreal, too simple, too easy, what you are saying sounds wonderful, she ventured. I wish that I had the faith to believe and accept it into my life. I do know that the Messiah is coming soon, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. If he teaches the same things that you are teaching me now, I will believe. My dear woman, the Messiah that you are looking for is right here, talking to you today. I am He. Her mouth dropped open. Could it be true? Had she just sat at the feet of the Messiah of Scripture? It all made sense. She remembered a passage from the prophet Isaiah. Come. All you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Oh, how she had longed for this bread and water from heaven that could fill her up and bring meaning and satisfaction to her life. And now, sitting beside her was a man with a wonderful face and a kind, gentle voice giving her the same invitation. Come, let me give you a drink of living water. Could this be the Christ? Leaving her water pot behind, she ran into town, telling everyone she met, Come and see a man that told me everything I ever did. Is this not the Christ? What can we learn from this 
wonderful story from the life of Jesus. I believe that it is rich, like a field of glimmering diamonds. We won't have time to look at them all today, but I want us to consider a couple of lessons. The first thing that I would like us to glean from this story is how Jesus gave us an example of how to share the gospel. So often we might be a little bit shy to share our faith. If we do get up the courage, we often go about it so badly that we offend the people that we're talking to, and that only reinforces our shyness to try again. Notice how Jesus asks the woman for help. My dear woman, I wonder if you could give me a drink. What a wonderful way to break the ice when meeting a stranger. It is amazing how defenses come down and suspicions fade away if you can simply say, I wonder if you could help me. There's something about human psychology that makes most people want to be helpful if they can. It is hard to turn someone down who is asking for help. Try this next time you want to talk to a stranger. Greet them and ask them for help with something. The second thing that I would like for us to consider this morning is who Jesus chose to speak to as he passed through Samaria. It was a woman. Not just any woman. A woman who many of us might have given up on long ago. A woman many Christians would describe as living in sin, a five-time divorcee. Whatever we may think of her marital status or her current living arrangements, I'm so glad that it didn't matter to Jesus. He still saw this woman as a precious soul that he would soon give his life for, and he desperately wanted to talk with her help her, minister to her. That gives me so much hope and reassurance. In many ways, I am just like the woman at the well. We are all like the woman at the well, sinners living in sin. It may not be the same kind of sin as the woman, but we are all living in sin nonetheless. How comforting it is to know that Jesus doesn't turn his back on people who need him the most, people who know that they are sinners, people who are searching for salvation. It is always interesting to me to read about how it was the super-religious that Jesus rebuked, and it was the sinners and tax collectors that he loved to hang out with and minister to. I believe that the reason Jesus liked to hang out with these people is because he knew that they were the ones that most recognized their need. The religious leaders were so busy keeping all of the rules and regulations and trying to get everyone else to keep all of the rules and regulations that they did not realize how sinful they really were. They believed that if they could just get everyone in the nation to keep one Sabbath day perfectly, Messiah would come. How tragic it was that the Messiah was in their midst and all they wanted to do was kill him. I believe that Jesus gives us an example of who we should be mingling with, who we should be seeking out, who we should be speaking to. Jesus often said, healthy people don't need a doctor. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I have come to 
Seek and save people who are lost. I have left the ninety and nine to go and find the one lost sheep. I believe that we need to learn how to see people as Jesus sees them. Not so much as horrible sinners, but as people who have lost their way. People in need of help. People who long to be saved. Actually, I think that we need to give the Samaritan woman a bit of a break. This was not 2020 in Canada. In Jesus' day, women had absolutely zero rights. They were considered to be not much more than property. A man had to give a dowry of animals to his wife's family in order to marry her. And because of this, marriage was not so much about love as it was a financial transaction. Men considered their wives to be not much more than slaves. As a result, women in the times of Jesus were often treated no better than a man's donkey or his camels, suffering abuse physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually. Men had absolute power. All possessions and land were in their name. If a wife got out of hand and the man wanted a divorce, there were no long legal proceedings. There was no 50-50 split of assets. All a man had to do was say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Three times, and that was it. The woman would find herself out on the street without her children and no way to make any money to survive except for begging or prostitution. I thought that this horrible practice was all in the past. Unfortunately, it is still with us today in many parts of our world. Last fall, I visited a remote community in northern Kenya in my work for ADRA. In many ways, it was like stepping back in time to Jesus' day. The people who live there are pastoralists, where people are defined by how many animals they have. Men have multiple wives who, just like in Jesus' day, are acquired through the payment of a dowry of animals. As I interviewed some of the women, I discovered that the quick divorce was still a problem in their community. If a woman refused to obey or accept the will of her husband, she could be just as easily divorced by repeating, I divorce you, three times. One woman told us how she tried to stop her husband from putting their daughter up for marriage at the age of 13, wanting to add another 15 camels or so to his herd, her husband was letting the village know that their daughter was ready for bids. When the mother tried to object, he threatened her with the quick divorce. She would find herself out on the streets with nothing. What could she do? I am happy to report that now that ADRA has been working in this community now for the last four or five years, all of this is changing. Women are forming groups and learning about their human rights and the laws and protections that they have as a citizen of Kenya. Because of ADRA, Women are rising up. Now, as a group, they can put collective pressure on any man in the community who is not following Kenya law that says that a girl must be at least 18 to be married. They are also learning about 
the property rights that they have as Kenyan citizens. They are learning about divorce law. ADRA is teaching them business skills and how to become financially independent. As you can imagine, the women that I spoke with were very grateful that ADRA had come to work in their village. Amazingly, all of the men that I spoke with were also filled with gratefulness to ADRA. ADRA had shown them a better way. The whole community has been lifted up. One last thing I would like for us to consider this morning is the living water. Each one of us is born with an emptiness in our hearts that can only be filled with this living water. Some call it a God-shaped void, a spiritual thirst, a spiritual hunger. Even secular anthropologists have recognized this and say that people are hardwired to worship God. It is genetic. They call it the God gene. We long to worship and serve our Creator. The sad thing is that most people don't understand what this hunger in their lives is all about. And they try and fill up this emptiness in their hearts with the things of this world. When the things of this world don't fill the void in their hearts, they become frustrated, sad, depressed, even suicidal. What's the point? Life is so painful. How is it with you this morning? Do you identify with the woman of Samaria? Have you been searching for truth, meaning, and purpose? Have the relationships of this world let you down? Have the teachings and philosophies of this world left you empty? Is it sometimes hard to face the day? Jesus says, Come, all you who are thirsty, and drink freely of living water. If you have not yet done so, or if it has been a while since you drank of this living water, I encourage you to do so today. Accept the invitation of Jesus to drink of this living water. This is not some mysterious, obscure message given under the shade of a pomegranate tree 2,000 years ago. It is, in essence, the summary of the entire message of Scripture. It is the water that poured forth from the rock in the wilderness. It is the water that poured out from Jesus' side on the cross. It is the bread of life that was broken for us, the blood of his life that he gave for us. It is the great treasure the pearl of great price. It is the experience of being born again, the new life in Christ. It is the new covenant promise of rest from our labors of legalism, God's law of eternal love and righteousness engraved in our hearts and lives. And as if in summary, the very last passage of Scripture extends the invitation one more time when it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Are you thirsty this morning? I invite you, to drink freely of God's living water. Shall we pray together? Our wonderful Father in heaven, creator of all things, you have made us, you know each one of us, 
just like you knew the woman at the well. You know that we have been searching for you. And as we recognize your invitation today to drink of that living water, we pray that you will fill our hearts, our lives, our minds with this gift from above. Fill us with your love, your joy, your peace, your satisfaction today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May God be with you as you go through this week. Remember the invitation that he gives to you to come and drink of this living water. <laughs>